I'll keep the introductions short. My name is Matt, and I am, a, was, an avid fan of urban exploration. If you've never heard of it, the short explanation is this. In any city or town, there are multitudes of abandoned, hidden places that most people don't even know exist. Old, unused railway stations, miles and miles of tunnels, hell, even whole reservoirs of water. Urban exploration is the practice of finding and exploring such places. I got into it when I was 17, and ever since then, I've been hooked. Good thing, too seeing as I'll be spending my entire life in the underbelly of this city, hunted by an uncaring government that probably wants me dead to ensure my silence. The man who went through this horror with me, who I know only as Rodriguez, sits next to me. He too will spend the rest of his life hidden away, a mute observer and confidant as I write these words. I don't hope to forget what I've seen. That will never happen. The best I can hope is that, after reading this, you too will see the truth one day. So, here it goes. The day it began, I left my house in the morning, full of excitement. I'd received a tip from a fellow urban explorer about some sort of old, abandoned complex deep beneath our city. She'd sounded ecstatic about her find, which I could hardly believe. She was an explorer far more experienced than me. This place really had to be quite something to get her this worked up. She told me that it looked like some kind of semi-military installation, abandoned for God knows how long. Perhaps a World War II-era resistance hideout, she'd theorized. As if I needed more reason to see the place. I had my usual gear with me. A flashlight, a coil of rope, and a first aid kit. I wasn't expecting any trouble, but it pays off to be ready. Exiting the surface through an innocuous-looking rusted door, I walked, climbed, and, in places, crawled for an hour through a series of ducts, chutes, and cable-strewn passageways. It was clear that this was not the correct entrance to wherever I was going, but rather an ad hoc infiltration route. Already, I was captivated. Finally, I dropped down from a grimy air duct, lifted my lights, and looked around in wonder. My friend hadn't been exaggerating. This place was an urban explorer's dream. I was in a large, circular room with four exits, apparently a crossroad of some sort. Narrow passageways led off in every direction of the compass, all but one sloping upwards. The last led steeply downward. The floor, covered in a deep coating of dust, was broken up by waist-high concrete blocks, with shallow trenches excavated behind each one. Looking back on these events, I realize one thing. These concrete blocks, obviously intended to take shelter behind, were all facing towards the single, downward-heading passage. Whoever had built this place hadn't intended to defend against an attack from the surface, but from beneath the ground. In my excitement, I somehow managed to ignore this fact. After taking a photo of my surroundings, I continued down one of the passageways. Obviously, I took the one heading downward. The corridor went on for about half a mile before ending at a large iron door, an iron circle set in its center. I grabbed it and pulled, and at first it wouldn't budge, but after several hard pulls, it swung open with a squeal of rust-covered hinges. Beyond was another room, this time with only a single other corridor, again leading down. I gasped. The center of the room was dominated by a wide wall of sandbags, several heavy machine guns, the kind you see in scenes of trench warfare, were mounted on the top. All were pre-aimed at the corridor heading downward. I went closer, rummaging for my phone. This was unlike anything I'd ever seen while exploring. Old, abandoned underground stations were one thing. Goddamn machine gun nests were another. As I approached, I frowned in confusion. The floor was covered in a heavy coating of dust, but around the sandbags, large, booted footprints were imprinted in the grime. I stooped down to take a closer look. These prints were fresh, days old at the very most. Someone had clearly been tending to this place recently. I shone my light up. 
The trail led off into the dark of the downward corridor. A small, nagging doubt pulled at me. Someone was clearly using these tunnels. Might it have been my friend? No, that couldn't be it. She'd have told me if she'd found something like this. Besides, if these were her tracks, they'd have come from the surface. I should have turned back at that point. Why didn't I? Some goddamn curiosity. The thrill of discovering something new stopped me from doing the reasonable thing. I stayed where I was, like an idiot, staring at my strange find. A half-heard sound up ahead made me look up. I got a split-second glance of movement, a dark figure moving at the corridor entrance, before all hell broke loose. A bright, blinding flash of light turns my vision into white fire. There was a sound like rolling thunder all around, unceasing. I was blind and deaf, distantly, as if in a dream. I felt myself falling to the ground under the sensory assault. A second, and yet an eternity later, the attack on my senses stopped. Through the ringing in my ears, I heard the stomp of boot-clad feet. Contact! Someone yelled in the whiteness my sight had become. There was a loud bang, and something impacted the concrete right next to my neck. I'm being shot at, I thought numbly. Hold fire! Yelled another voice, deep and authoritative. I've got no reading on the spectrometer. It's not one of them. What if it's a ghoul? A third voice. Ghouls don't get caught unaware like this. He's a civvy. Get your gun out of his face for Christ's sake. What's a civilian doing down here, Rodriguez? No idea. That was the commanding voice again. Bag him. He has to come with us. Rough hands gripped me. I swung blindly at their owner and missed. A split second later, something with the force of a sledgehammer hit my face. I staggered, reeling from the impact. Before I could recover, a rough bag was placed over my head. I screamed. Another blow. Don't struggle, came the voice again. If you do, I'm authorized to use lethal force to neutralize you. Please, I... I began. You will remain silent. You will not struggle. You will come with us. Not if you understand. My mind raced, adrenaline and panic threatening to overcome me. I was blind, miles from the surface, and surrounded by armed men. In under a minute, this trip had gone from intriguing to horrifying. I nodded, mutely. Get up, came the voice. Someone hauled me to my feet and led me forward, stumbling and blind, deeper underground. At first, I tried to keep my wits about me, remember the distance and directions we took. If I could somehow escape these people, whoever they were, I needed to backtrack to find my way out and to the surface. Soon, however, I gave up. The disorienting, suffocating blackness of the bag made it impossible to keep any sort of bearings. Once, after half an hour of silently stumbling through the dark, I tried to beg with my captors. Please, I began. I don't know anything. I was just... I didn't get further. A hand clasped over my mouth, almost suffocating me with the heavy fabric. You will remain silent at all times. This is for the safety of both you and my men. If you endanger us one more time, I will be forced to neutralize the threat you pose. I shut up very quickly after that. Another unknown span of time passed. I don't know how far or long we'd been traveling, when suddenly... A loud, electronic beeping broke the trudging silence. I heard one of my captors curse under their breath. Shit. I've got a reading. A hundred meters ahead and closing. There was a quiet clack of upholstered weaponry. A hand pressed down on my back, forcing me to lie flat on the ground. I felt someone's hot breath next to my ear. Whatever you do, remain absolutely silent. That was the voice of the man they'd called Rodriguez. Don't move. Breathe quietly, unless you want to be found. And trust me, you don't want to be found. The beeping got more insistent, higher pitched. Fifty meters, someone said. Lights out, sound down. The beeping stopped. No, I could still hear it, but muffled, incredibly quiet echoing from an earpiece. It was growing faster, more insistent. Breathe quietly unless you want to be found. 
The shallow inhale, exhale of my captors and the blood pounding in my ears suddenly seemed as loud as a thunderstorm. For a few terror-filled seconds, it was absolute silence. And then, to the head, one of the soldiers yelled. The air exploded with the sound of gunfire. It was an unceasing hammering as my captors emptied their clips, ran dry, reloaded, and fired again. Strobing light flashed through my hood. The stench of gunpowder choked my throat. I almost screamed. The fire died off as quickly as it had begun. There was a click as someone slotted a new magazine into their rifle. Movement. Negative. Spectrometer. No reading. It's either dead or escaped. Get the civvy up. We need to move before more of them arrive. I was hauled to my feet. This time, we didn't walk down the corridor, but went at a brisk jog, strong arms holding me up whenever I stumbled. Finally, just when I thought I couldn't take any more, we stopped. There was a grinding of iron hinges. Through the black bag over my head, I could hear voices, the hum of machinery, the bustling of activity. The air changed, becoming warmer, more packed. Somehow, I knew I was in a massive room, or maybe a cavern. There were unseen people all around me. I was led forward again, up a steep flight of stairs and along some sort of gangway. A door squealed open, then shut behind me. Without warning, the bag came off my head, and I squinted at the sudden light. I looked around, amazed, afraid, and confused in equal measure. I was standing in some sort of large office. Maps and reports peppered the gray concrete walls. A heavy steel table dominated the center of the room. Behind it, mounted on the wall, was a massive electronic display showing an intricate map of interweaving corridors, rooms, and caverns. Various points on the map glowed green, while several blinked a threatening red. A man stood behind the desk. He was tall and muscular, with salt and pepper hair, dressed in combat fatigues and a plain black shirt. A gun was holstered at his waist. Before I could say anything, he held out his hands to me. My name is Major Rogers. Sorry for the treatment you've had, but it was unfortunately quite necessary. Utterly confused, I took the offered hand and shook it limply. I, uh, Matthew Daniels. Roger smiled at me, though it was a forced expression. I'm sure you have many questions, but I'm afraid I can't answer any of them. In fact, you do best to forget everything you've seen and heard here. I, I'm... I began. Please, take some time to collect your thoughts. Roger said. There are certain matters we must discuss, and it's best if you have your wits about you before we begin. I swallowed hard, the thousand questions I was thinking of, forcing my racing minds to stop and assess. What is this place? I asked, finally. That's classified, Roger answered. What the hell is going on? I said, forcing an edge of anger into my voice. That's also classified. Like I said, I can't tell you anything. Then what's going to happen to me? Roger sighed. I'm afraid you're going to have to stay here for a while. Possibly even a few days. I don't have the authority to make the call of what to do about you. We've notified command of your presence, and someone with higher clearance will be on their way shortly. My guess, you'll sign enough NDAs to bury yourself under. Then you'll be given a new identity and relocated to somewhere no one knows who you are. My head swam. That was insane. This couldn't be real. This was... You... You can't do this, I whispered incredulously. I... I have rights. There's... There's no way. I'm afraid none of that matters down here. Not in this war. I leapt to my feet, the chair crashing down behind me. You son of a bitch. You let me out right now. The door opened behind us. A grim-faced woman... A pistol gripped in her hand peered inside. My heart sank. Everything all right, sir? Yes, Corporal, Roger said calmly. 
Leave us, please. The woman glanced at me, then shrugged and closed the door again. I collapsed in my chair, defeated. I understand this is hard to come to terms with. I will have my soldiers escort you to your temporary quarters, where you can gather your thoughts. Then, without a warning, Siren drowned out the Major's words. He wheeled around. On the screen behind him, green lights were rapidly turning red all over the map, all converging on one place. From outside the office, I heard frantic activity, snatches of desperate reports and orders. Spectrometers 12 through 47 triggered. I've got movement on the west side tunnels. This is Delta Camp requesting immediate... Rogers grabbed a microphone from his desk, keyed it on, and brought it to his lips. Code black, I repeat. Code black. He said, his voice tense. The perimeter is breached. They're coming. When I try to remember the fall of Delta Camp... There are two things that stand out in my memory. Only the knowledge of the truth and Rodriguez's mute urgings keep me writing. The first thing that stands out is how fast the defenses were overrun. The other is the first time I saw one of the things from below. Major Rogers leapt past me, gun in hand. He slammed open the door of his office and ran outside, bellowing commands. After a second's hesitation, I followed. I didn't know what was happening, but somehow, I knew that to stay in place was to die. Running out of the door, I got my first glimpse of Delta Camp. It was in a large cavern, a hundred meters or more wide, lit by industrial lamps hammered into the high stone ceiling. Capillary tunnels and passageways led off in every direction. Each was surrounded by a mass of defense positions, redoubts, trenches, machine gun nests, bunkers. Dark-clad soldiers ran about in chaos, trying to reach their positions in time. A siren was wailing incessantly, uselessly. The gunfire began without warning. Within a single second, hundreds of weapons opened up. Tracer rounds searing in the darkness of the capillary tunnels. The muzzle flashes were an insane light show, casting deranged, jagged shadows onto the walls. I couldn't see what they were firing at. And then, I could... That is, strictly speaking, a lie. I never saw the things that came from the tunnels and tore Delta Camp to pieces. They moved too fast. Or maybe they weren't even really visible. Or maybe... I never saw them. Only shapes in the corner of my eye. Only peripheral glances and suggestions. A shadow darted out of the tunnels. No, not a shadow. Just the memory of a shadow. The ragged shape of a crow's wing. The soldier came apart. Blood spraying out of a dozen wounds. And the thing was already gone. Leaving corpses in its wake. I wasn't alone. They were not there. And yet, they were everywhere. Flitting out of the tunnels and strobing gunfire. As intangible as smoke. As murderous as knife blades. I stood in the center of this chaos, dumbfounded, unable to move. It was as if my mind was frozen solid, incapable of even the slightest action to preserve itself. A soldier ran past me, stopped, turned back. An explosion blossomed behind her, casting her as a black outline against a field of red. Hide, damn you, she yelled at me, bringing her face right up to mine and screaming over the deafening gunfire. Hide if you want to live. She motioned to the side at a wide rectangular waste container standing half full, propped against a bunker wall. I stared at her, mouth half open, not even processing her words. She hit me in the face, and that did it. Snapping out of my trance, I ran to the container and lifted its hinged lid. Something red and spurting blood fell against me. I pushed it away, leapt into the container, and slammed the cover shut. And then, there is no memory at all. I don't know how long I crouched in that filthy hiding place. It may have been minutes, and it may have been hours. The sounds of gunfire outside weakened, grew quieter, then went silence completely. 
Then there was only desperate screaming. And then there was nothing. Only darkness and terror. Slowly, my mind returns to me. I shivered in my hiding place, both in fear and cold. The temperature was dropping by the minute. I couldn't hear anything from outside. Could I move? Could I take that risk? Whatever had come out of the tunnels, the things from below, they had torn through Delta Camp in minutes. If even a single one of them was still out there, I'd be as good as dead the second I left my hiding spot. But what if they could hear me, or smell me, crouching in the filth? I had no idea what they were capable of, or what senses they could call on. Suddenly, the container seemed not a safe refuge, but a death trap. Every second I stayed there might be filled with danger, bringing closer things that move like butcher's knives and ragged silk. I made my decision. To move was better than to stay put. There was only a vague plan in my mind. Find a gun, maybe a flashlight, and head into the tunnels. It wasn't much, but it was surely better than staying put. There had to be a map somewhere in Roger's office. I'd find it, and then risk the tunnels back to the surface. Somehow, naively, my hopes all clung to that one concept. If I got to the surface, I would be safe. Slowly, carefully, I eased open the container's lid, wincing at every creak and groan the protesting hinges made. In the dead silence of Delta Camp, every single noise seemed amplified to impossible heights. Finally, the lid opened enough for me to slip through. The cavern was almost pitch black, whatever generators had powered the base long since destroyed. The only source of illumination were dark red emergency lights set in the walls, casting everything in an ominous crimson. I dropped to the ground and landed in something wet. I looked down and almost vomited. Delta Camp had been the site of a massacre. The dead carpeted the ground. Most had been torn apart, shredded, and cut down without mercy. I had landed in a lake of viscera. I doubled over, retching. Not ten paces away, I saw the woman who had told me to hide. Both her arms and half her face were gone. White bone glistened wetly. I gagged, barely managing to wrestle my stomach under control. Focus, I thought to myself. Don't look at them. A weapon, flashlight, map. Focus. Trying not to look down, I crept through the ruins of Delta Camp. Every shadow and little noise was filled with dread. With each passing second, I expected to feel unseen claws pierce my back, tearing me to pieces in less time than it takes to scream. The stairs to Roger's office loomed up ahead. I slowly inched my way up them, wincing at the loud clanging my steps made. It seems to echo around the cavern like thunder. At one point, I stopped. Certain I'd heard something move in the detritus of battle below me. For a minute, I stood stock still, half crouched, preparing to leap away into the dark at the slightest sign of danger. Nothing. It was nothing. I had to keep moving. Slowly, I reached the top of the stairs and snuck down the gangway leading to my destination. All I needed was to get inside, and then... Voices. I froze. Every sense I had was stretched to its limit. Every muscle bunched and ready for flight. There they were again. Whispers, barely audible, coming from behind the closed door to Roger's office. Shit, I thought to myself. I stood still, trying to calm my breathing and catch what the voices were saying. Move out as soon as possible. I'll be back. That's certain. And we can't stay here waiting for more survivors to find us. Where do we go? Who's to say Gamma Camp hasn't been overrun as well? 
Same goes for Beta and Alpha. We have no idea what's happening up above. All our communication lines are dead. The first voice again? If Alpha's been taken, we've already lost the war. If we strike out for the surface, it'll give us a chance to survive, at least. Staying here is suicide. A new third voice. Does anyone know what happened to the Major? There was a pause. The Major's dead, said someone. I saw him again. I saw it happen. He's gone. God. We can mourn later. Right now we need to get moving. I'll be back soon. And the tunnel will be crawling with ghouls, too. Right. You're right. Time to move out. Through the door, I heard footsteps. Shit. I thought to myself. Panic rising up to smother me. I scrambled backwards, desperate to get away from the door and hide. In my haste, I forgot to move silently. My foot clanged loudly on the metal stairs. I froze. The sounds from within had stopped. The door swung open, and dark shapes moved within, bristling with weapons. A flashlight stabbed at me, blindingly white. Don't fucking move, someone hissed. Hands above your head. Do it now. I did as I was told. The dark shapes moved forward, resolving into a squad of seven soldiers dressed in dark combat uniforms. All were armed to the teeth. They trained their guns on me, edging closer. Who the hell are you? said one of them, a dark-haired man with a goatee and angry eyes. He stepped closer, bringing the muzzle of his rifle up to my face. I I'm... I'm Matthew Daniels, I stammered out. I I'm not one of you. I I'm a civilian. Please, I'm just... Ain't no fucking civvies in Delta Camp. The soldier interrupted me. He half turned his head to his comrades. He's a ghoul, dammit. Would you just shoot him and be done with it? He's telling the truth, Anderson, said a familiar voice. Rodriguez, I realized. One of the men who'd captured me. I was there when we found him. Somehow, he found his way into one of the fallback tunnels. Anderson glared at me, clearly distrustful. Put your guns down. He's not a threat. Rodriguez repeated. Slowly, grudgingly. The soldiers complied. What do we do with them? Someone asked. I... I began. Leave them, growled Anderson, cutting me off. He's just dead weight. A civilian won't make it five minutes down here. We can't just leave him down here, someone said. You're right. He won't last five minutes without us. It's just as much a death sentence as if we shot him right here and now. And we're not shooting him, Anderson. I... I started again, only for another soldier to interrupt me again. Gamma Camp's half a day's journey away. He can't keep up that long. We'll see about that, Anderson muttered, half to himself. So it's decided, said Rodriguez. The civvy comes with us. The entire squad looked over at me expectantly. I nodded, weakly, head spinning. All right. Time to move out, Enriquez said. The group filed past me, weapons half-raised. For a second, I stood, dumbfounded. Things were moving too fast for me to follow. Rodriguez turned around and raised an eyebrow. You coming? Finally, I nodded and fell in behind him. Our group crept through the ruins of Delta Camp and entered a passageway sloping upwards. We were a bobbing line of flashlights, illuminating the darkness with cones of luminescence. Every now and then we'd reach a crossroads. At those times, the soldier in front would consult her map, exchanging a few quiet words with one or two comrades, then set out down one of the corridors silently. I imagine you have a lot of questions, Rodriguez whispered to me as we stalked through the dark. That's an understatement, I muttered. Major Rogers said that he couldn't tell me anything at all. Well, the situation has changed a bit, wouldn't you say? Rodriguez answered. If we're going to get out of here alive, we'll need all the help we can get. 
I'm sure the higher-ups won't be happy about it, but considering the clusterfuck this whole operation's become, I'm pretty damn sure I can afford to let you in on a few secrets. I stayed silent. Rodriguez continued. There's a massive network of tunnels beneath this entire area. It stretches out for miles, and it goes way, way down. There's things living in these tunnels. The official name is USL. Uncategorized subterranean life form. We mostly call them the things from below. We don't know what they are or where they came from. All we know is they want to get out. And we can't allow that. I... I think I saw one of them when the Delta Camp fell. I said... Well, I, I didn't see it exactly. It just movements. No one ever sees one. Rodriguez replied. There's never been a confirmed visual. We never found a body or caught them on video. You can barely catch them. Just glimpses in the corner of your eye. Or a blur of movement before they strike. It's like your gaze skims to the side every time you try to get a proper look. How do we fight them, then? Rodriguez rummaged around in his tactical vest and pulled out a palm-sized black box. Several wires led off from it, one leading to the earpiece he was wearing. We use these babies. We call them spectrometers, although I have no clue what kind of wavelength or radiation they actually pick up. They can detect the things from below, tell you their rough direction and distance. In the tunnels, that's enough. You pre your gun down where they should be, and you pray to God they don't get close enough for you to get a glimpse. And if they do, you open up and hope you hit them. Quantity of firepower is just as important as quality. For each one of these things, every person in a squad will fire a full clip of full auto, sometimes two, just to be certain. We don't know if the bullets actually hurt them, but if you're lucky, they'll disappear or retreat or die or whatever the fuck it is they do when they get hit by our firepower. That's why we need to keep this contained. Keep it in the tunnels. If they ever get to the surface, it's over. In the open, you just can't fight them. So, you don't know where they are, or where they come from, or if you can really even kill them? I said, head spinning. How long has this been going on? Rodriguez smiled grimly. Whole generations. We don't know how many... The rumor is, Anderson's granddad was stationed here. His dad, too. Might explain why he's so damn grim. This is the first time I know of that the things launched an attack like this, though. It's always been ambushes in the tunnels, preying on our patrols and stragglers. Wait, Anderson's grandfather fought here. That would mean... The war's been going on since Stalin breathed his last. Longer, possibly. I cursed under my breath. Rodriguez smiled grimly. Until now, the war was a stalemate. They couldn't get out, or we couldn't move forward an inch. Once, a scout and patrol managed to get real deep into the tunnels, miles down, into an area we call the Pit. The single radio report we ever got back from there spoke of some sort of structures down there. A temple. we never been able to confirm that, though. I trudged on in silence for a while, letting all this sink in. When you captured me, someone mentioned ghouls, I said, finally. They thought I was one. Oh, right. Rodriguez answered. I forgot about those. He sighed deeply. Every now and then, a patrol or a small camp will go missing. Sometimes, those men are found dead. Sometimes they come back, but change. They worship the things from below, I think. The tunnels are full of them. They're fast, they're strong, and they can hide pretty much anywhere. The spectrometers don't pick them up either, so you need to stay on your guard. Looking up, I saw our group had stopped at a crossroads. The lead soldier once again checked her map. 
left to think about Rodriguez's words, I felt a wave of terror mounting inside me. It was as if I was suffocating, drowning in my own fear. What should I do? I asked him, the words a choking whisper. Everything's happening so quickly. Can we even hope to live through this? Rodriguez put a reassuring hand on my shoulder. Keep your wits about you and stay as quiet as possible. We'll see you through the rest. I raised my head to thank him. The shadow, standing quietly behind Rodriguez, opened its eyes and smiled. Guns came up, lightning quick reflexes taking over among our group. These men and women were born for this war, trained for it their whole life. Still, the ghoul was faster. It leapt forward, slamming into Rodriguez and knocking him to the ground. The first shot fired went wide, crisscrossing the air above the pair of writhing shapes. Rodriguez kicked out, catching it in the midriff. The ghoul rolled over backwards, folded itself into a piece of shadow, and was suddenly gone. Lights, roared Anderson. Back to back, lights on. The group leapt into formation. I squeezed in next to Rodriguez. He was breathing heavily, great gasps of air shaking his body. Are you all right? I asked. Bastard tried to kill me. He growled. My Kevlar stopped it, but barely. We were back to back, guns pointing outward, stabbing at the shadows with our flashlights. A voice came from the dark, seeming to come from several sides at once. A chill ran down my back. It was barely a hiss, but every syllable had the deranged promise of bloodshed to it. Oh, my pretties. It crooned. So alone in the dark. So lost. Let me just take one to the temple, and I'll be on my way. Shit, that's Crowley, muttered a soldier. I knew him. He went missing in action half a year ago. Fuck, muttered Anderson. Then, louder, addressing the shadows around us. Crowley, I don't want to kill you. If there's anything left in this soldier that I knew, come out, or leave us be. Don't make us hurt you. Instead of an answer, a patch of darkness above our heads suddenly dropped down. A blade glinted in the half-light, and a soldier fell to the ground, gurgling blood from a slashed throat. The group opened fire. Flash of light. Crowley was there, a gaunt skeleton of a man dressed in rags. Flash of light. He was gone. The circle reformed. The wheezing, choking soldier pulled into our center. The temple gates are wide open. Crowley crooned from somewhere in the shadows. It can't be undone. Everyone will see the truth soon enough. And one of you, one lucky person, will get to see it ahead of schedule. Do I have any volunteers? What truth are you talking about? I asked, unsure where the courage to address this monster even came from. The old truth. The first truth. Older than man. Older than time. Older than light. One of the soldiers fired into the dark, nerves tightening his trigger finger. In the flash of light, we saw Crowley standing on the opposite side of the circle, just for a split second. Lights swiveled to point at him, but caught only the edge of a ragged cloak before he was gone again. Enough of the cryptic bullshit, Crowley. Anderson growled. Either fight or go to hell. Haven't you noticed, Anderson? That's where you came from. Welcome to the real world. Crowley materialized out of the dark, knife raised, mouth open in a leering, skull-head grin. He smashed into a soldier, ramming the blade up to the hilts into her shoulder. Her scream of pain and his deranged laughter melted into a single, tortured sound. He was too fast. We couldn't get a beat on him long enough to risk a shot. Rodriguez leapt at the blurred shape, dropping his rifle and grabbing Crowley in a bear hug, hoping to immobilize him. The insane soldier slipped free, slippery as an eel. 
With one hand, impossibly strong, he grabbed the neck of the woman he'd wounded, then took off down the tunnel, laughing maniacally as he ran. You'll grow old down there with us. Oh, so old. Older than light. Older than light. Older than... A shot rang out. Crowley spasmed, a fountain of blood erupting from his shoulder. Somehow, he kept on running. The next round took him in the lower back. He stumbled, righted himself, just in time for the third bullet to hit him dead center, rippling through his spine. He dropped, suddenly a boneless sack of meat. We sprinted after his prone form. The woman he'd grabbed scrambled backwards, desperate to get away from the madman. Anderson walked over to Crowley, standing over him, legs wide like a vengeful god. Hold. Older than... than... I... The ghoul began, choking on blood. Fuck you, Crowley. Anderson spat and shot him in the face. The next ten minutes were a flurry of activity I had no way of participating in. The soldier whose throats the maddened ghoul had slashed, a young private named Miller, was surrounded by medics. Despite their efforts, they could not staunch the flow of blood from his slit neck. He would be dead in minutes, and we all knew it. The woman who Crowley had tried to abduct was shaken, but once her shoulder was patched up, she seemed capable of carrying on. I walked over to Rodriguez. Are all the ghouls this bad? I asked under my breath. No, he answered. They're always dangerous, but this... This is like nothing I've ever seen. He was just playing with us. If he hadn't gotten greedy and tried to take Ross, we might all be dead. If all the ghouls are like this now... He trailed off. A shiver ran down my spine. Gamma Camp's still a long way off. He continued after a moment. With luck, we... A loud, insistent beeping cut him off. Even in the half-light of our flashlights, I saw Rodriguez go pale. Shit. Oh, shit. I recognized that sound from the time of my abduction. A shiver ran down my back. It was the high-pitched alarm of a spectrometer. The hunt wasn't over just yet. We have to move, Anderson asked. Someone, get Miller up. Rodriguez and another soldier moved to pick the wounded private up, but he shook his head at them, weakly, raising a hand in objection. Go. I'll hold them. He gurgled, blood running down his throat and through the makeshift bandages wrapped around it. Miller, Rodriguez whispered. Instead of replying, the wounded soldier saluted with a shaking hand. Die well, Anderson said, simply. The group turned and set off at a dead sprint down the tunnel. The spectrometer was wailing insistently as the things from below approached. From the passageway behind, there was the sound of gunfire, percussive flashes that were suddenly cut off. Rodriguez crossed himself as he ran. We came to a crossroads. Not even stopping to look at the map, the soldier in front leapt into the left fork then cursed as her spectrometer began wailing louder. They're down that tunnel as well. Take the right. Something moved in the murky darkness, like a murderer's shadow on snow. The woman was ripped backwards without even the time to scream. We sprinted into the right fork, Anderson loosing a flurry of bullets into the left as he ran. That was how they hunted us. We would reach a fork, try to head for Gamma Camp, only to be turned around by a spectrometer reading. Unseen things heading us off, turning us around. Soon, we were running downward, into the bowels of the earth, away from our intended destination. Without any warning, the concrete and steel reinforced passageways suddenly became rocky tunnels and caverns. We had left the man-made defenses of this war behind and entered enemy territory. I find it hard to write about these events. They are the most confusing and harrowing parts of my journey. A mess of fear, gunfire, and exhaustion in my memory. Rodriguez sits next to me as I write. I look over, and he is smiling reassuringly. 
He smiles a lot these days. We were only five now. A nameless soldier in front of me was suddenly gone. Dragged away into the shadows by a leering, knife-fingered horror. I grabbed his gun as it clattered to the ground, firing blindly in the direction the thing from below had dragged him in. I don't know if I even hit anything. Finally, after what seemed like hours of burning lungs and cramping muscles, the spectrometer quieted down. For reasons we couldn't possibly guess at, the pursuit had ended. Or at least, eased off. We stopped, gasping for air, doubled over. We have to make a stand. Anderson wheezed. They're driving us to the pit. We have to break out, or we're as good as dead. Why the hell do they want us down there? Rodriguez asked, hands on his knees, trying to catch his breath. Before, we could never even get half that deep. And now they're hurting us there, of their own accord. I don't know. Whatever it is, it can't be good. We have to make a stand. Anderson repeated. No way. The war's changed. There's too many of them. Maybe these things can be stopped at Alpha Camp. Hell, maybe even a Beta or Gamma. But there's only five of us now. And Matt is a civilian. We barely have the firepower to take down a ghoul, let alone fight our way back out of the tunnels. Then what do you suggest we do? Anderson asked, turning on Rodriguez. You have a better idea? We head further down, right into the pit. Face it, man. The chance of us getting out of here alive are slim to none. If there's something down there that these things are guarding, I'd like to see it before I go out. Anderson was silent for a while, regarding my friend mutely. Finally, he shrugged. I don't care what's down in the pit. I care about revenge. I'm staying here and taking my pound of flesh from these things, and hopefully getting back to our own lines. Anyone who wants to join me is welcome to. Anyone who wants to go with Rodriguez and head further down, be my guest. But I won't pretend to think it isn't a fool's errand. The remaining soldiers shifted uncomfortably, then moved, one by one, to stand behind Anderson. Gripped by a sudden compulsion, I took a stand next to Rodriguez. He was right. The chance of getting back to the surface was next to zero. Whatever waited in the pit, I wanted to see it, and then allow the horror to end forever. Anderson nodded at us. Good luck, he said, grudgingly. When you get out, send us reinforcements. We'll do the same for you if we get out first. Anderson's sudden, naive optimism took me by surprise. By his expression, I could tell Rodriguez felt the same. Good luck to you all, my friend said. He turned around and headed down the dark tunnel, flashlight bobbing. I nodded to the assembled soldiers and followed him. For some time, we trudged on in silence. The sounds of Anderson and his group were quickly cut off by distance and the snaking, twisting passageways. Thankfully, our spectrometer remained silent. Maybe the things from below were satisfied with our heading, or maybe they were busy with our comrades in the tunnels behind. Suddenly, at least half an hour after we'd departed, Rodriguez's radio sprung to life. He pulled it up in shaking fingers. Its sounds were static-laden, broken up by the winding tunnels. We could barely hear a voice. Anderson's voice. I realized with a start on the other side. Even through the static and distortion, he sounded desperate. This is Anderson, 7th, requesting backup. We are surrounded. Anderson, Rodriguez whispered into the radio. What's going on up there? I re requesting backup. Anderson continued, ignoring us or unable to hear our reply. From the darkness behind us, a desperate gunfire staccato broke the silence. Rodriguez cursed softly. Anderson's voice came again, more desperate. My squad is dead. Falling back to... Can anyone read me? There was silence for at least half a minute. The only sound, the thunder of my own heartbeat in my ears. 
no reply came to our frantic attempts to answer. Finally, the radio crackled to life again. Rodriguez? Came Anderson's voice. He sounded strange, not panicked or desperate as before. More amazed and horrified. A chill ran down my spine. I couldn't place his tone, but it made me uncomfortable. Like nails on a blackboard. Rodriguez, I can see one. I can see one. I have a visual. What can you see? Rodriguez hissed into the radio. What can you see, Anderson? It's... Came the reply. It's beautiful. We were silent for a while, unsure what to say, how to react. It's beautiful. And finally, Rodriguez sighed in acceptance, his head slumping. Nothing more we can do for him. Come on, don't want to keep them waiting down there. Shouldering our rifles, we headed further downward. The corridors grew larger, as wide as the main street of some ancient metropolis. The floor became a paved road, hexagonal bricks inlaid into the stone itself, forming baffling geometrical patterns. Many side tunnels led away into the dark, but we kept to the main road, heading downwards. Always downwards. Rodriguez's spectrometer began beeping incessantly as we caught glimpses of the things from below. Every side chamber and tunnel held one. Brief glimpses of smiles like murderer's knives and shapes like shattered glass. We didn't flee this time, though. They weren't hunting us anymore. They were welcoming us in. And finally, we reached it. The bottom. The pit. The temple. I look up as I write these words, locking eyes with Rodriguez. He doesn't say a word, but smiles reassuringly once more. Though the reason for his mirth eludes me. It gives me the will to continue. We entered a massive cavern, its walls soaring up around us. Its roof so high it was hidden in blackness. No more side tunnels, no more of the endless descent. This was it, the bottom of the pit, the heart of whatever was happening within the earth. It all came from here. Rodriguez cursed softly under his breath as he saw what waited for us. I gasped, unable to stop myself. The cavern was dominated by a gigantic temple, carved from the cold rock itself. Soaring minarets, half seen in the dim torchlight, towered above us. Shadowed windows loomed, hungry and ominous. Archways and vaulted roofs spanned the blackness. It wasn't the scale of the temple that gave us pause, though, nor the half-seen multitudes of things from below, pale shadows promising murder, held back by some unknowable command. It was how unmistakably inhuman the temple was. Every stone was without blemish, every archway and vaulted ceiling flawless, and yet it was hideous. It was too perfect. It was built in no style that a human mind could have ever envisioned, and that terrified us. Every piece of stone within its ancient bulk was cut with geometric precision that should have been unachievable, as if the very stones were laughing at the laws of nature. It had beauty, but only so that it could torture it and bend it into shapes it should have never taken. This place is old, whispered Rodriguez. Way too old. Older than light, I answered, unsure where the words came from. My friend gave me a sidelong glance and swallowed loudly, then continued, his words coming out in a breathless whisper. Let's... let's keep moving. They're watching us. Looking down, I saw that the front of the temple was taken up by a massive gateway. The arch covered in symbols and reliefs I shudder to remember. 
The gate. It was wide enough. I couldn't see what waited within. The darkness was too deep, too absolute. But there was something just behind it. Suggestion of movement. A hint of some great, shadowed form. That was all we saw. Something was waiting for us. Had been waiting since the beginning of mankind. Or the Earth. Or maybe the beginning of time itself. Older than light. All around us, the things from below bowed. Murder made subservient. Darkness kneeling before an older darkness. Violence and shadow and fear bowing to something even more ancient, more profound than those very concepts. The first truth. We stopped. Our journey to this depth had been to see precisely this, but at the very brink of the door, we stopped. A sound from behind made us turn. There was movement in the main tunnel we'd come from. The sound of padding footsteps. Rodriguez raised his rifle. The darkness shifted, and a long figure emerged. It was dressed in tattered remains of a uniform, a pistol strapped to its waist. Even bloodied and injured, it looked almost familiar. Almost like... Anderson. Rodriguez breathed. Our former comrade smiled in the half-light, the rictus grim sending a chill crawling down my spine. It was not a pleasant smile. The same kind Crowley had given us as he ran through the tunnels, dragging his helpless prey behind him. Hello, Rodriguez, Anderson said. Rodriguez took a step closer. He didn't lower his rifle. Are you all right? Anderson laughed, a high manic sound. Better than all right. I've seen it, Rodriguez. I've seen it. Seen what? The truth. The old truth. The first truth. Crowley was right, damn it. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. He took a step towards us, then another. My own gun came up, though I barely knew how to use it. Stay where you are, Anderson, Rodriguez warned. There, in your head, I'm your friend. I've known you for years. You have to fight them. Anderson paused, then laughed again. But this time, I heard something else behind the sound. Anguish? Regret? I can't. Can't fight it, Rodriguez. Can't fight the truth. I can't fight the truth. Without warning, he leapt forward, fast as a snake, screaming in bloodlust and suffering. Rodriguez hesitated. Just for a split second, he froze. It was too much for him. The horror we'd been through, the sight of the ungodly temple. And now one of his old comrades, back from the dead, and ravening for our blood. For a split second, Rodriguez held his fire. And then, Anderson was on us. There was none of the shadowy subterfuge Crowley had used. Anderson was a whirlwind of nails and teeth, too fast to be human. My rifle was torn out of my hands. A sledgehammer blow crashed into my teeth. I tasted blood. Rodriguez grabbed Anderson from behind and threw him onto the ground. The mad soldier whirled like some sort of grotesque insect, coming up at an instant, sinking his teeth into his opponent's shoulder. Rodriguez screamed. Around us, figures like broken glass on skin crowded closer, smiling with teeth of black ice. I staggered to my feet, swinging a wild blow that caught Anderson on the side of the head. He rounded on me with a snarl, slipping under my second punch and grabbing my throat from behind. I choked. The world went gray. Stop, Anderson. I heard Rodriguez shout somewhere in the distance. His voice was dim, removed. An urge to sleep was overcoming me. The shadows crowded closer. Your father and his father gave their lives to fight these things. Rodriguez was yelling. 
fight them. You're still in there. The hold on my neck relaxed a fraction. I dragged a giant breath into burning lungs. Can't fight the truth. Anderson whispered somewhere behind me. Can't fight the truth. The first truth. The older truth. Older than man. Older than time. Older than light. You know that's bullshit, Rodriguez said, looking at the madman over my shoulder. You can fight it. You can. Please. The vice holding my neck weakened a little more. Can't. I can't fight. The... Came a pained whisper from behind me. A drop of something fell onto my shoulder. Tears. I can't fight the truth. A deafening gunshot rang out behind me. I felt the heat of the bullet. Something red and hot sprayed across me. I wheeled around. Anderson had pulled out his pistol and shot himself in the head. Rodriguez stumbled over, helping me up. He looked down at his dead friend, then made the sign of the cross. The shadows watched, silent, mocking. Finally, Rodriguez turned around. Let's finish this. I'm tired. We turned, weapons held to our chests, ignoring the shadows crowding closer, then strode into the dark gate of the temple. At first, we saw nothing, the blackness enveloping us completely. I could only hear Rodriguez next to me, breathing heavily as we pushed onward. At first, we saw nothing. And then, the blackness peeled back, and we saw everything. Oh my god, Rodriguez whispered next to me. It's hideous. It's beautiful, I answered, smiling to myself. I don't know how long the ascent up from the pit took. Time had, after all, lost all meaning. A day... A year, a century, it was all the same in the end. I live in the tunnels beneath the city now. Sometimes I go almost up to the surface, near inches away from people who have no idea I'm there. I hear them. Conversations thought private. The crying of children. The deep, calm breathing of those asleep. I hear it all. And no one ever hears me. I return to my abode after every journey. A small hole under a railway system. Rodriguez waits for me there. He's still smiling. He's been smiling ever since I returned from the pit. Ever since I killed him. I carved his eyes out. He couldn't see the truth when it was right in front of him. I cut his mouth into a rictus grin. With the truth in his grasp, he screamed and cursed and blasphemed. So I killed him. He's not much of a talker since then, but he's a much better listener. I will need a companion down here in the dark, after all. I intend to stay here all my life. To grow old in the dark beneath the false world. Older than man. Older than time. Older than light. <laughs>